act out musicals in my living room. Um, but then I started taking voice probably officially when I was like nine. Um, and fortunately my voice teacher had a lot of connections like in uh, Minneapolis where I'm from. And I, I was able to make like a demo CD when I was like 10 years old of like three songs. And he, he found community outreach events where I could sing at, um, things like that. So, um, that was, that was a kind of cool experience. I'm glad I started taking voice kind of even for that reason. Cause as we know, half, half this business is just connections and who, you know, and being out there, getting, getting yourself seen. Um, and then I continued to do shows, both professionally in Minneapolis, which I feel like gave me a lot of great experience. Um, and then also at, like at, at school, I did several high school shows as well in community theater and kind of built a framework of training through that and being able to do that kind of throughout my youth. Um, I feel like my weakest training wise has been in acting. Um, if, if you were to break it into like acting, singing, dancing, I took dance for like 13 years and I was a dancer. I did competition studio dance for a long time um, and ended up quitting in high school because theater wanted all of my time and dance wanted all of my time. And I just couldn't do both anymore. And I knew with theater, I could do it, it all. <laughs> I could dancing and act. And that's really what I loved. So, right. um, but I was so grateful for all those years of training. Um, and then voice I continued to take through high school and then I, for college, I was able to look at um, a lot of different schools. I knew I wanted to pursue musical theater. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get to visit a lot of my top choice schools. My mom and I like did a, a couple weekends of trips and, and actually visited um, some of the top choices. And I got, you were able to get such a feel for a place the minute you set foot on a campus. And some of them I knew just weren't right for me, no matter how great they were on paper. I was like, this doesn't feel like I don't want to spend four years here. Um, so I actually only really got excited about two schools and that, that I looked at. It was Cincinnati Conservatory and University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, random. Right. And I'm from Minnesota and I had a friend that went to Stevens Point and, um, that's how I heard about it. And they actually have a super strong triple threat program. Yes, and do. so I actually only auditioned for those two schools. And I know now it's different. All the kids are auditioning for like 18 schools and That's it's they put so much pressure on themselves. And I just, I didn't do that. I wanted to only go where I got really excited and I didn't get in at Cincinnati and I did at Stevens Point. So I went go. to Stevens Point and I learned a lot uh, that first year. And then I ended up getting offered a job uh, back in Minneapolis at the Children's Theater Company. It's a Tony Award winning regional theater that I worked at a lot growing up actually in my youth. Was and that uh, uh, Wendy Lars company? Yes. Yes, I know Wendy and Gary Brickle quite no well. No way, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I had done several shows there in my youth and one of the directors there at the time, Matthew Howe, mm -hmm. um, contacted me and was like, would you ever consider they're considered taking a year off of school to be a performing apprentice at our theater. And that year they had six apprentices. Now I think they literally only do two every year. It's one boy and one girl. So it's okay. a very selective program, but sure. you get paid, not very much, but a little to um, be in the ensemble of all every show in the season. You're understudying the leads in every show this season. You're doing workshops and classes um, as well as developing new works that the theater might potentially be doing. You're doing readings and things like that. So you get to be an intern on the job at the at the theater and get paid for it. And I got weeks toward my equity card and all of that. And so I thought school will always be here. This opportunity may not. So I am going to I decided to take a year off from school and do that internship. I ended up meeting my husband that year. Um, so that was good that I did that. Uh, we met doing a show that year. And then I actually, when I was looking at going back to school the following fall, I was still auditioning in Minneapolis just to kind of, you know, keep my options open. And I ended up booking Sandy in Greece at a dinner theater, Chanhassen Dinner Theater in Minneapolis. And I thought, again, I can get paid to do what I was going to school for, mm -hmm. or I could pay to learn in the classroom and I decided to take that job and then while I was doing Greece was when I found out about that reality show that I did <laughs> seven that cast me in Greece on Broadway so crazy well, what was that what was that process like is uh, you know did you send in audition tapes like how, how many what was the process in getting cast in the show like I uh, flew to Los Angeles. I actually wrote a letter to my director because I had to miss performances of Greece and Minnesota. Oh boy. 
And I found out about this and I had this thing in my spirit that was like, go, like you need to do this. And I was like, this is impossible. I'm not doing this. And I just, I couldn't, that voice just would not be quiet. So I had to, I wrote a letter to my director and I said, here's what I'm feeling. I found out about this audition, but obviously my, um, my dedication and devotion and my commitment is to you in the show right now. I signed a contract and you expect me to be here. Is there a world where I could take a weekend off and fly to LA to audition for this? And I was like, I knew the stars had to align and they did. He wrote back and he said, yeah, I, he's like, I agree. I think you need to go. (laughs) So it was just the door opened and um, I flew to LA and I had to keep calling him and go, I have to stay an extra day. I made it to the next level. And my understudy went on for like five days in a row. Um, and that was crazy because I, there was like, you know, a thousand, a thousand to 2000 people in line in LA. They auditioned in four cities and, um, they, yeah, I, I, you first sing for like a producer in a room. And then if you're good enough, you get to save for the next day to sing for the actual judges, which were Kathleen Marshall, who is, you know, Tony, Tony award-winning Broadway director and choreographer. And she, um, directed Greece. Um, Jim Jacobs, who wrote Greece, right. and David Ian, who was the British producer behind the project. So then you're singing for those people. I made it past that level. And then the third day, we had a dance call. And by the end of the third day, they had narrowed it down to 25 people from the, you know, couple thousand that auditioned in LA. And then the 25 from LA and the 25 from the other three cities. So the other three cities had a combined 25. So it was 50 people. That was, we did like a Greece Academy for a week, which was like Broadway boot camp. And again, as I'm going back to do Greece and Minnesota in the meantime, and then like a month later, I have to go back to LA for Broadway boot camp. And I'm like, worried about ruining my reputation with this theater in Minnesota. And now that I'm like, I'm putting them really in a bind. Um, when did they start filming? It's so crazy. What, how it were, they, were they filming you at the very top of this? When did they start the cameras? Yeah. Well, the whole, yeah, the whole process was televised. Yep. Went from when we were standing in line with thousands of people. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Amazing. And, uh, and then Greece Academy happened and they narrowed it down to six boys and six girls of which I was one. And then I had to leave the show in Minnesota and move to LA. So <laughs> the director's daughter ended up taking over the role for me. Ah. And, um, I, I, th- then we performed live on TV every week and I just had this upward spiral. I feel like I just kind of scraped in, in the top six. I was kind of the last pick. And then every week just That's got very it. modest build well it's kind of true if you go back and watch it don't go back and watch it everybody <laughs> but like if you go back and watch it <laughs> Kathleen is like one of the one of the judges was like I don't know she kind of disappeared you know into the background for me and Kathleen was like no I saw something sparkle in her today and they ended up saving me I was the sixth of, of I was the last of six girls to get chosen to pick it for the finals and I just felt like the whole time I didn't push my way to the front of the line. I was just like, all I can do is be me. That's, that's good advice just in general. I'm like, you, if you're supposed, if you sparkle and you love what you do and they will notice you, even if you're, you know, in the back. So I feel like that's kind of what happened that day. Not that I was in the back, but I just knew that all I could do is be me. And if they wanted me, then they would see me. Um, and so as, as the weeks happened, I feel like my performances kept getting stronger and stronger as where the other girls who were maybe the front runners from the beginning and the obvious conventional choices had to kind of almost maintain that status throughout all the weeks is where I kind of came in and just had this, you know, uphill climb to the end. And I was never in the bottom two. Every week, the bottom two people had to have a sing off before someone was eliminated. It was oh, crazy. No. And I was 20 years old. Like no one knew what we were doing. Um, oh. But I'm very grateful for that experience, and it opened yeah. obviously a huge door for me and put me on the map. And yeah, um, yeah I'm I'm glad I like didn't know better at the time because it's stressful. It was a lot. I'm I wouldn't I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> now I don't have to. I guess. <laughs> Thank goodness. I'm glad I did it, but wouldn't do it again. <laughs> That's great. I mean, it's it, it's it was an amazing experience, like to watch and and see you be a part of that and succeed so well. Um, so after after Greece. Um, your next big gig was in South Pacific, right? Uh, yeah. And you stepped in for Kelly O'Hara. So what was it What was it like to go into a show that was already running and have a character that was, well, at least Kelly's performance was in place. Yours was, was of course, different. But what was that like? Did you work with Bart? And what, just tell me about that process. Yeah, it was... Um... 
I was so grateful that that was my next Broadway thing because I feel like it legitimized me. You know, mm. I kind of came in as like the reality show girl and, you know, that reputation, I still had to work really hard to prove myself. Even after proving myself week after week on television, it came with a negative stigma. And so doing, getting South Pacific was like, finally, I felt like I'm, I'm legit. And I went through a series of four callbacks for that role. So I did feel like I earned it. I didn't just get it because I was a name, uh, which who am I? I was not a name. I was just the reality show. Thing. I was like, I was the hot girl of the moment. Um, but I, I, that process was crazy. And I'm also grateful. I have that experience being a replacement because it's very different from getting to be in rehearsal with everyone and like creating cast camaraderie. Like I was getting plugged in to a machine that was a beautiful machine that was already running and they all knew each other and they were all best friends and they knew all the backstories and the subtext. And like I, as a replacement, you have rehearsal with the stage manager and the dance captain. And Bart came in for like maybe three rehearsal, you know, three rehearsals to kind of give some notes and feed me some things. Um, and then would watch a couple of my performances and give notes, but not to the extent of a full rehearsal process. So again, you're kind of having to do a lot of that work on your own and it's two weeks. It's like being homeschooled. You do, you learn the whole show in two weeks and then you go on and it's like, you, you're able to do it so much quicker because it's just you. But I, you only get one shot. You have one put in rehearsal where the whole rest of the cast shows up in their sweatpants and you're in your costume running the show. <laughs> um, and you don't, I didn't have an orchestra or full lighting until the night I was on in front of an audience. Oh boy. Night. Wow. So, you know, you walk out and everything's blinding. You're just trying to like hit your spots and um, it's crazy. It's crazy wild, but it's amazing what adrenaline and <laughs> <laughs> everything can do to get you through what we do as actors and understudies going on and people performing with severe injuries. It's just, it, we're athletes. We're athletes in that way of body, mind, and spirit. I just feel like um, you, you kind of have to be, you can still be kind, but you do have to have like a thick skin to kind of get you through things like that. Not that, I mean, I felt very prepared for it, but um, it was big shoes to fill. You know, Kelly O'Hara, I, she was, my idol growing up. I saw her in Light in the Piazza twice sure. and little did I know that four years later I would be replacing her at on the same stage the she was doing on that same stage it's just wow. it was a total pinch me moment and she was very gracious yeah. um, very funny because she was pregnant at the time right so when yes. the day I was trailing her I didn't have much to do with her to be honest we had you know I trailed her for maybe two performances and that was kind of it. Um, but she was like, Laura, this will be so much easier for you because you're not pregnant. <laughs> so I'm joking, joking about that. And the cast was also just so lovely to me and I couldn't have been more grateful to be welcomed into a cast. So that's also another thing I learned from leadership, from having been in that situation that when I was in Cinderella and we had a lot of casts, you know, crossover and new people joining the show and people leaving, I made a point to always try to make the new person feel really loved and welcomed and um, a part of the family that we had created because I knew what it was like to be the new person coming in. And it's sure. <laughs> well, I, I actually was very fortunate to see both performances. I saw Kelly and I saw you. And Aww. I, well, I thought what was incredible was I would not have guessed that you had had two weeks because the, uh, the role was a completely different role. You did not feel like it was stepping into someone else's shoes at all. I felt mm -hmm. like that you had created your character from the very beginning. So kudos to you for that. Thank you for saying that. I, mm. you know, to be honest, I was 23 at the, at the time, I think. And I, I feel like in that moment, I didn't want to come in and completely reinvent you know, obviously she had been nominated for a Tony. She's Kelly O'Hara. And the, you know, that cast had an expectation as to the thing. So part of me watched her and didn't try to, you know, verbatim emulate her, but I, I felt like what I was doing was very much inspired by her. I didn't want to come in and reinvent the wheel. I was like, I'm going to start with hitting my marks, but literally at my put in, I had two of the cast members came up to me and said, you are such a breath of fresh air. It is so different. And it's so fun. Mm. And I was like, I'm different. I thought I was trying to kind of be the same. Um, <laughs> I'm a different person. I just have a different essence. And so uh, that also gave me a lot of encouragement for like auditions and things like that, where it's like at the end of the day, like I said, you can, you can only be yourself. And even if you're trying to be someone else, 
you're gonna be, I mean, what's most important is you're genuine and you are who you are and you bring yourself to the roles. But even when I was like trying my best to like bring my best Kelly O'Hara version, it was, people still were like, it was so different. And it's so just trusting who you are and what you have, I think is so important. And I learned that too, doing that role. Well, if, if there's a theme or a moral to this conversation, it's, it's that uh, be who you are. Yeah. And, and you're exceptional at doing that. So that's great. Oh, thanks. Uh, side question. Um, do you still keep in touch with Danny Burstein and how is he? Yes. Um, you, I, uh, it's hard to be honest. Um, yes, I do keep in touch with him. I saw him a couple months, just like a month and a half ago at an event right before this all started. But I think he's going through, their family's going through a big hardship right now. I think health wise, he is on the mend because he had COVID, sure. uh, confirmed case. But you know, his wife, Rebecca, also. Yes, is very sick. Yes, is sick and her body is deteriorating. And mm -hmm. I, my heart just breaks. I've had a few times of just thinking about them and crying and um, they're just are both salt of the earth people yeah. and so generous and loving and um, it doesn't they don't deserve what's happening right now and I just I wish them the best and I've texted on and off but I know they're being kind of inundated I haven't kept in touch I haven't personally since uh, Danny got COVID been in touch with him okay. personally but I've been following his updates and stuff on social media yeah, I, I, I've never worked with Danny, but the reason I know him is because he and Rebecca came to my daughter's middle school production of The Drowsy Chaperone. <laughs> <laughs> because they lived down the street by PS9, and they heard that there was a production, and he, of course, was in the original cast, and he came by and talked to all the kids. Oh, my he, gosh. What a, it, sweet, what a sweet spirit he is. Yes, yes. He oh, was generous. so great. So ah. I, I, I admire him a lot. Me too. And he's so, so good in everything he does. So oh, good. That vulnerability he just has, it just endears you to him for life. <laughs> and he brought that in South Pacific as well. And especially with the role he played, he's Billis. So he, yeah. he fell, you know, he has such a heart for Nellie and she's just like, oh, Billis. But he was just so, he cared for her so deeply. And it was just so lovely to be on the receiving end of, of that from Danny because he just, he's so good. And he just has, his eyes are so deep and lovely. Yes. I, when I saw the show, uh, the person I saw it with commented on Danny's performance. And he said, finally, someone gets who the most, the most incredible unrequited love affair in musical theater, which is Billis and Nellie. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's so well said. If that's you didn't know that, you know now. Yes, <laughs> that that's because really of his, the underlying thing. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. So was this, your career is so interesting because here you go, you, you, your reality TV show and you're plugged into Greece and then you go into Bonnie and Clyde, or I'm sorry, um, South, South Pacific. Pacific. And then your next show, big one, is Bonnie and Clyde. Anything totally, Goes was between oh, that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, yeah, so, and so that was... Oh, that's an extra interesting step because here you go, you're into a revival of a show, but it's your character now. You were there from the beginning. So tell me about what that step was like. So right. Um, so I actually, and I didn't mean to, I was doing workshops of Bonnie and Clyde and we mm -hmm. had done the Bonnie and Clyde out of town. We had gone to La Jolla. Yes, I did go. We had gone to La Jolla um, before. And then when I was, I was in Florida uh, with Bonnie and Clyde at our second out of town tryout when I found out about the audition for Anything Goes. Uh -huh. And I flew in on a Monday um, from our day off from uh, Bonnie and Clyde in Florida to audition for it. And uh, that was fun and joyful. And I knew, actually, with that specific audition story, just because I think it's interesting, the role of Hope had actually already been cast. And uh, ne her, during negotiations, the, the deal fell through and they were seeking an immediate replacement. Um, so I was called in with a few other girls and Kathleen Marshall is directing. So this is who directed oh me gosh. in Greece and who watched me week after week in the Greece reality show. And I remember thinking, what can I, what am I gonna do in that room that she hasn't already seen me do? Not that I expect to get an offer, I really don't. I just was like, I don't know, what else can I do? She's seen me do everything. I've jumped through every hoop for her on national television. Um, so I didn't know how I was gonna be magical or whatever. And I came into the audition room and I read with Colin Donald, who was cast as Billy. And Colin and I had known each other. We did a concert version of Pride and Prejudice together once after Greece. It was like a two week thing. Um, 
And so that was fun to see Colin and I knew Kathleen. And I remember at the end of my audition, I thought it went fine. It went, it went well. Um, but Jim Carnahan, who is the casting director was like, Hey Laura, can you just wait outside for a second? And I was like, yeah, sure. Great. Like I thought this was like good news, like cool. And then I waited and he came out and he was like, actually Laura, we're so good. We're good. We got you. And like, thank you. And I was like, Oh, and then literally 10 minutes later, I cry. I met my husband at Starbucks, like down the block. And I got the phone call while I was at Starbucks with Nate and with the offer for the role. So I was just like, Oh, it ha that happened. Amazing. Um, so sometimes you just never know how it's going to happen. Like I said, with South Pacific, I had a series of four auditions and callbacks and had to be approved by the Rogers and Hammerstein estate and all of this stuff. I had a chemistry test with Paolo Schott, who had just won the Tony Award for his wow. performance. And I was like 23, like shaking in my boots. Um, a chemistry but, test. I did. like guys and dolls all of a sudden. Exactly. I, Bart had called me and he was like, well, this was for South Pacific. He was like, we didn't think we would go with someone this young. We want to make sure it works. I'm 10 years younger than Kelly. So you know, she was... 33 at the time and I was 23 so we it needed to work um and so uh but with anything goes that was just it was a gift it was a total dream come true and I was so excited to work with Sutton Foster another actress I had looked up to for a very long time um sure. as well as work with the legend Joel Gray and to have my co-star be Colin when he and I had worked together on something small before that was just a nice kind of comforting thing um and then to get to work with Kathleen again and continue to develop that relationship and I also, Jessica Walter played my mother and she was a hoot and a half. I loved, loved, loved it. And that ended up being a very important um, show for me. I actually, my, I lost my mom to cancer nine years ago and I was dealing with that while I was doing Anything Goes. And to, to literally have that kind of champagne of a show that it became an escape and my character's name was Hope. And uh, that cast was with me through all of that. And um, that was, it was very necessary for me to be doing that show at that time in my life. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, Sutton is someone also who I admire for providing leadership in a company too. You know, she was, she was amazing and uh, little women carrying the bulk of that show on her yes. shoulders. Yeah. So. She, you guys, she's the absolute best. She brings such a prepared, bright energy into a rehearsal room. And she also, she has, ba she does bagel Sundays. She bagels, yeah. <laughs> so she just buys everybody in the building bagels every Sunday. You know, you can come to the theater and have bagels from Sutton for the yeah. run of the show. It's just so generous. So mm. generous. Yeah. Well, I, you've worked with some really marvelous actors and directors over the course of your career. Uh, and we've talked about Danny and Sutton. Like, who, who do you admire and why? Like, who, since you didn't have a, a classical university education, who, who were your mentors? Um, like I said, I feel like I, I learned on the job like that. Like, and it's whoever I was with at the time, like Victoria Clark was another mm. one. Um, again, after seeing her in Light in the Piazza and knowing of her talent and her work for such a long time, having her literally play my fairy godmother in Cinderella was just wonderful. I call her mama bear to this day. I still call her mama bear because she's just, she became like family to me. And same with Rebecca Luker, who, as we've already discussed, replaced uh, Vicky. Vicky went to do a play for like three months and Rebecca mm -hmm. came in and um, Rebecca is just so lovely. She's an angel on the earth. Um, and, uh, you know, I looked up, like, like I said, I grew up listening to, um, you know, Sutton and Leah Salonga, all the Disney soundtracks and, you know, those, those types of voice, Susan, Susan Egan, um, Linda Etter. I don't know if you guys know Linda Etter from the like Jekyll and Hyde soundtrack. Right. She's from Minnesota. So I knew of her too from Minnesota. <laughs> um, like voices like that I, I listened to. Um, and like Julie Andrews, I grew up with all those Rogers and Hammerstein movies and, you know, Shirley sure. Jones and, um, and, uh, like Judy Garland. I grew up with the Wizard of Oz, like watch, watching that. Um, but as far as like actual mentors, I think that that would just be like the authority figure in the show of, mm. of the moment. I, I don't, I haven't had really like one through line person yeah. creatively who has been looking out for me from day one. I've worked with a lot of different people and have, you know, continued a lot of those relationships, but, um, and all of the people have invested in me and helped you know, given me wisdom and opportunities, but it's always kind of, it's always kind of our, our seasons and our families change based on the jobs that we're doing. And, um, it's, you always find the one or two in this moment that become that for you. 
Sure. Well, I, so you went to Anything Goes, and then, uh, but you're in the middle of the process of Bonnie and Clyde, and here is your first chance to originate a role uh, on Broadway. So what, what was the, it, it was a long tryout process. So mm -hmm. what was the process like um, with the new role, new musical, changes being made all the time? What, uh, how was that different or the same from your previous experiences? Yeah, it's quite different. Um, like, the, like I said, the previous three things had all been revivals and one, a replacement. So you're getting plugged into something that already exists. Um, and even script wise, like we're not, we weren't able to make that many script changes in Greece and then anything goes. Suddenly with Bonnie and Clyde, you're creating something from nothing. And I'm the first person to ever sing these songs and bring a voice to this role and help this character come alive. And it's just the best as an actress, like that's what you wanna do. Like originating roles is the most fulfilling thing to get to do. Um, but it is a huge investment. Bonnie and Clyde was three years of my life um, doing oh. workshops, two out of town tryouts. So we went out of town the fall of 2009, I believe. And then again, the fall of 2010, so a whole year later. And then finally, the fall of 2011, we came to Broadway. So years of my life that I'm like waiting for this thing to happen and investing in. Um, but I wouldn't change it. I mean, I'm still so glad that I did it. That, and then to, after all of that, to have the show only run two months is wow. obviously the hard thing because um, we all believed in it so much. But a lot of good came from that. We made a cast album after the show closed, actually. The show mm. closed and we we got together four days later and recorded the cast album. No kidding. Uh, because we needed the show to live on. <laughs> we, sure. we just did, and Frank Wildhorn, and uh, we actually, Broadway Records was created for the Bonnie and Clyde cast album. And now they, ha they have done actually a bunch of cast albums and do solo CDs at 54 Below and things like that. Um, sure. But that record label was created for Bonnie and Clyde to be able to do that, to, to record an album. Sure. Um, and I also got a surprise Tony nomination five months after we closed, which was just the greatest gift. Um, but creating something is just so special because you feel the role really starting to be catered around you and what what I brought and my essence and the, how I would say things and you just you have more say if something doesn't feel right you can kind of cre have a conversation about it and I I learned so much because I, I learned that my voice is valuable and I don't just have to be a pawn and be told what to do I'm like if I have an idea I can voice it and we can discuss it. And then tomorrow there can be a change made. And it's just, it's really cool to be part of the developmental process like that, for sure. That's amazing. It really, really is. So, um, so you work with lots, I mean, an untold amount of people, different actors and things like that. And many of them went to uh, these uh, musical theater programs, the universities worldwide, and some of them didn't. Like, what do you see as, um, uh, is the biggest benefit of, of the people who have these degrees and what also like, what do you think the people should know that maybe these schools aren't teaching? Like, is there a professional angle that? Wow. Yeah. That is a great question. Um, I'm going to say the the two people that come to my mind most are Santino Fontana, who is my prince in Cinderella, and he graduated um, from the Guthrie acting program in Minnesota. Um, so I actually knew of him as well before uh, we work together in Cinderella just from that Minnesota connection. Um, but, you know, I was, when I found out that he was cast and that we were going to do Cinderella together, I was a little not worried because I was like, he's so book smart. And I'm like, I'm so like instinctual. Like I just, I'm like instinctual. Let's play because you're right. I don't have like methods that I'm pulling from. I just, I have experience and I know how to feel feelings. That's, that's literally what I say to people. So, um, I, I was like, I don't know if our, our work ethics are going to mesh as, is he going to wish I was smarter in that way? Or am I going to wish, am I going to feel, yeah, I just was worried that I would, I wouldn't, I would feel inadequate. Um, and then same with Corey Cott. Corey is 
super smart, super bright, very studious Carnegie Mellon grad. And he like talks about his training a lot. And he's like, oh, when I learned this at Carnegie Mellon, when I learned this at Carnegie Mellon, and I'm like, um, but what I think what's so cool is that I found we've been able to balance each other in a beautiful way that I don't, I don't have these methods, but like, I love to play. And I love to try and figure it out and have conversations and build and feel feelings. Um, and that I feel like, especially with Santino, I was able to kind of loosen him up a little bit and uh, create just for a really kind of fun backstage experience and creation process. But as far as, uh, I don't know, I think, I think it's very personal and I think, I think school is for some people and I'm an, I'm an advocate for school. I was a straight A student. It's not that like, oh, school's bad so I didn't do it or school isn't really worthwhile. I don't think that's the case. It just ended up not being my path. Mm -hmm. And so even in high school, I did a post-secondary education. So I would go to high school in the morning and then I left, this is junior and senior year, I would leave midday and then a couple days a week go to a college campus and take a class on at a college and it helped free up my schedule and get credits so that I could do theater to do what I loved. And I remember always saying, I can't wait for the day when I can just do this and I don't have to also read 1200 page books and write 20 page papers. Like I was so ready as great as those things are. And I think you all need to do them. I just, I was so ready for life in the business. I just, I wanted it and I was ready. So that's, I think, what ended up happening for me. I got offered an opportunity and I was like, I'm going to take it. But I think school is great. And I think you can learn so much in the classroom and so much growing up happens in those years, like independence, you know, you, things you need to learn um, just even for, for your life. Um, so I, it's not that I wish schools taught this. I do wish there was more like we need to teach actors about like taxes and like how to, how to like manage money or how, you know, in, and thing, things like that. I wish I was better at. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there are people that can do those things for you, but only you at the end of the day have a handle on your things the best if you care about those things at all. So having trusted advisors and like agent commission and you know how to get an agents that's a whole nother thing it's like it's hard to get a job if you don't have an agent it's hard to get an agent if you don't have a job like it's all a combination of kind of being in the right place at the right time and just continuing to put yourself out there and waiting for that door to open and then when it does being ready for it and seizing the day being prepared to um help that to launch you into whatever's next that's great so um recently you've had a, a lot of uh, tv work uh, from your work with Hallmark Channel and uh, Fosse Verdon. And can you tell us a little bit about how acting on film is different from acting on stage and maybe some of your experiences with those two shows? Sure. I was so excited. Um, I did two Hallmark movies this past year. I know at the beginning you must have had a bio that was like a, a few months old. Because I yeah. did, yeah, I did, the, I did two Hallmark movies last year, which was really a thrill. And to be honest, I was terrified going into it because all of my experience has always been on stage. I have been auditioning for TV film stuff for 12 years in New York City, and I've booked two guest spots ever, which was one day on set and like a few lines. Um, and that was one, one thing for elementary. Um, I did an episode of elementary way back when, when I was in Cinderella, and then just booked this Fosse Verdon thing. Um, and even with Fosse Verdon, I played Shirley MacLaine and I had one line. So it wasn't even that much. And I had actually auditioned for Anne Ranking. I'd auditioned for another role and sent in a tape and then got called back with the offer for Shirley. So it's not even for that, that I could trust what I had done in my audition and want and use that. I was like, oh, I got cast as a completely different role. And now I have to like do other research to figure out who this person is. Um, and it was... Again, I was just because it's not my comfort zone and I like rehearsal, um, t the TV thing was scary for me because you don't get rehearsal. You show up, I had, I shot one day for Fosse Burden and I had one line. So you don't, it's like, like, hi, nice to meet you. And we did it four times and that was it. I was done. And you just basically for TV, it's like the rehearsal is where you stand. It's a blocking rehearsal. It's stand on this X because the frame is, you know, only so big and they set up the cameras so that you have to land right there. That's what the rehearsal's for. You're not talking about 
subtext and uh, <laughs> who, the, who these characters are. Um, so learning to direct yourself kind of in that way, which is te what's terrifying for me. I'm getting better at it. Um, or at least having castmates, developing relationships with your castmates so that in the downtime, while you're sitting in the hair and makeup chair, you can be like, hey, can we talk about that scene? <laughs> or hey, can we run lines? Um, because you don't, you don't get the, those weeks of rehearsal to establish all of that, um, which I really missed. And um, yeah, I had, to I had to learn to feel comfortable feeling uncomfortable <laughs> or feeling like unsafe. And you do actually, it's a skill you get better at. And uh, memorizing too, memorizing the, you know, the morning of, um, and then, cause it's just so weird because the second time I've ever said the lines, the camera is rolling and it's recording to be, you know, used forever and for everyone to see once it's out there. So it's just a little more scary in that way, but I, I did end up overcoming my fear, um, and had a lovely time working on the Hallmark movies. It felt like a very safe place to okay. learn and to develop that skill. Um, the Hallmark Network was a, a very positive atmosphere to work in. And we shot both movies in Vancouver, which is stunning. I can't wait to go back. Now I'm like, yeah. I want to do all the Hallmark movies because Vancouver is <laughs> so, so beautiful. Um, right. And I was, I was lucky to have great co-stars who both had experience and uh, were able to kind of hold my hand through the process without judging me. <laughs> right. um, yeah, so I was, I was very grateful. Now, I, if I'm not mistaken, I may be wrong about this. Was it Julie Foldesai that did the music for that? Yes, Julie yes. Foldesai wrote the music for In the Key of Love, which yeah. was the first one I did. And she and I did South Pacific together. She's a Broadway girl. And then yeah. Joe Ritchie uh, wrote the script and he also has um, done some Broadway stuff. And yeah. Kevin Duda, who is yes. done, he was in the cast of Beautiful. Um, and we did that Scarlet Pimpernel concert together um, at Lincoln Center last year. He yeah. was the producer. And so Kevin uh, like works part time with Hallmark, and after the Scarlet Pimpernel thing was when he was like, Laura, I work, I produce part time on with Hallmark, and would you ever be interested in exploring doing one of those movies? And I was like, Are you kidding? Yes. Um. So I I got a straight offer for that Hallmark movie, which I was grateful for because I knew the people. But I think that's right. why I was so terrified because I was like, I think had I auditioned, I wouldn't have been cast. Like I, <laughs> I started to think that I wasn't good at TV film because I I'd, I'd only booked two things in 12 years. I auditioned for so many TV film things. I'm like, that's just not my gift. It's not where, where I live. The theater thing is my home and I know how to do that. And I know how to sparkle. Um, but I feel like now that I've over, and I think I, I began to use that as an excuse actually. Uh -huh. Why not to get better at it or not? I was afraid to take class and I was afraid. And now that I've overcome that fear because I've done it, and realized how fun it is, now I'm like, oh, now I want to take class. And now I want to get better at, right. at doing that skill. So I would encourage you all to challenge yourselves, to think outside the box, and don't be afraid to try something new because all of those experiences, whether you end up liking it or not, enrich you as a person and as an artist. Well, speaking of sparkle, which you just said, you also <laughs> created the Broadway Princess Party series. So what inspired that? How did you get the idea for that show? Um, and what yeah. is it? The people, not, not a lot of people know what it is, probably. Sure, I'll explain a little bit. Um, so I, I started, I co-created a concert series called the Broadway Princess Party with my friend Ben Rauhala, who is our music director um, for that. And he he actually it was his initial idea at a birthday party of his. I know him through Jeremy Jordan because he's Jeremy's music director. So I had met Ben through Jeremy. Um, and Ben was like, I have this idea to do like a princess concert where like you are Cinderella hosting like your birthday party and you've invited all of your princess friends. And so I was like, this sounds super fun. And literally like an hour later, I created a spreadsheet of all my friends' headshots next to the picture of the princess I wanted them to play. <laughs> and it, just, it ended up being just a joyful night of really positive music and like female empowerment, like all of these talented women in a room together, um, not competing against each other, but instead each having their moment to sparkle. Um, and it ended up just being way more kind of magical feeling than we all ever intended it to be. We thought it would be kind of just cheeky and fun to do. And it was that, but it was so much more. Um, and the audience felt that too. And so 54 Below asked us to come back. We had a, over the last, over the next two years, we had like a series of 12 sold out shows at 54 Below and then started to dream about bringing it 
beyond the walls of New York City and beyond 54. And we had a connection to a venue in Los Angeles and ended up booking a show there. I knew we had to scale it down. We couldn't have 15 girls flying to LA to do this and you know scheduling and money and all of that. So we created a version, Ben and I, that had just three girls. And um, at the time it was me and Susan Egan, who was Belle in Beauty and the Beast, and Courtney Reed, who was Jasmine in Aladdin on Broadway. And so three original Broadway princesses. Um, and we knew Susan, Ben had worked with Susan on something and we just like cold called her, asked her, he had a contact and she said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And now, um, it, again, it, it just became tremendously successful. And we now have an LLC, um, an official Broadway Princess Party company. We have a merch line and we tour the country. We started out very small playing like comedy clubs across the country. Like two years really? ago, we had connections with Susan Egan's husband actually um, is a talent booker for a bunch of different clubs and um he was able to kind of get us in to those venues on nights that they weren't booked and so we started there and then last year we started touring performing arts centers and we now have an agent at um, icm and are repped that way and it's um it's really special and now this year we're about we're we have like an exciting collaboration um, that we're going to announce probably the end of this year coming up. We're in talks about making an album, which is great. Um, we're developing a symphony version of the show to happen next spring. So it's been slow going. And again, it's my baby. It's been a lot of blood, sweat and tears and hard conversations and learning how to work together and run a company um, in addition to being creative and sharing the joy that uh, these characters and these songs really bring to people. They resonate, they're timeless. We realize that we have such a big demographic. It's moms and daughters. It's people my age who grew up with these movies and love these characters and songs. It's, you know, the gays who, who love Broadway and who love princesses. It's the cosplayers. Like there are legit like, you know, for all the Comic Cons and things like that, all of that fan base, that Disney animation fan base, sure. who like dress up and come to things, where it's really, it's been super fun. We've had like couples get engaged at our shows. Like it's, right. it's been um, really, really special. And we're, we have a lot still um, to grow and exciting things to come. But it's been a very cool thing to do when I'm not doing eight shows a week. And we're yeah. starting to also hopefully in the next year implement even more princesses to be part of our family so that we can have a few casts going at, at various times. That's smart. Uh, so you have a unique story of a stage kiss in Aladdin <laughs> <laughs> that turned out to be one of the best things that happened to you. Can you share that story? Yes. So I mentioned earlier, I met my husband um, doing that internship at the Children's Theater in Minneapolis. So it was in a production of Disney's Aladdin, speaking of princesses. And I was in the ensemble. And so was Nate, my husband. And we covered Aladdin and Jasmine. We understudied them. So now that would never be possible. Like, and mind you, this is Minnesota like 15 years ago. So um, I, uh, <laughs> the one day, the leads collided into each other. They were supposed to, but they like backed into each other. It said, they're after me. They're after you. If you know Aladdin, you know what moment I'm talking about in um, One Jump Ahead. And so it was the top of the show. And they turned at such a velocity where he bit into her forehead. He chipped oh. the tooth and she was bleeding from her <laughs> eyeball and using the loaf of bread to like sop up the blood. And um, they stopped the show and Nate and I went on together. And I gotta be honest, we kind of, we had a thing for each other, but I had just broken up with another boyfriend. So I was very kind of weary about moving forward. Um, but then we went on together as Aladdin and Jasmine and it kind of sealed the deal, I think. Um, everyone in the cast was like, when are you guys gonna start dating? Like everyone saw it before me. I was kind of the last to, to see it. Um, so our first kiss was on stage as Aladdin and Jasmine rode the magic carpet, the whole deal, and they get married at the end. So I'm in the little like Jasmine, like two piece wedding dress <laughs> and like kiss, oh, everyone's singing a whole new world, like rose petals are falling. And um, a year and a half later, we got married. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still like that every day at your house with the rose petals. Yes, yes, I just, yes, I have rose petals falling and like, yeah. you know, magic carpets flying and birds <laughs> tweeting everywhere, I wish. <laughs> but, that yeah. was really great was amazing that was absolutely meant to be and this may actually coming up this may nate and i will be 13 years married well congratulations thank you
That's great. Well, you've done so many leading lady romantic roles and, you know, you're kissing all kinds of people here. Like, um, how, how do you separate your performance life from your personal life? I mean, sure. was that ever a challenge or is it just easy? For, for me personally, I am very professional about such things. I think for certain personalities, it could be otherwise. I remember even when I liked Nate, um, people always are like, you know, so how about that kiss? And even Nate said to me, how about that kiss? Like after we started dating, he was like, that was pretty magical, right? And I was like, that was business. That was literally my response. And I feel so bad because he's like my husband, like he was my husband, he became my boyfriend at the time. And I was like, that was business, like the one on stage. So for me personally, I feel like, I guess I've always somehow been good at putting up that wall and, and, you know, blocking, <laughs> being able to like emote in that way where it's like, but I, no matter what you become close to a co-star, you just do. There are, and I think there's an element of that that is very important and you need to be able to trust and, you know, care for your co-star in not that way, but in a similar way. What I, what I tend to equate it to, and I hope you guys understand me when I'm saying this because you're actors and you're artists and I hope this makes sense and isn't weird, but it's almost like I, I, Laura, there's a piece of me that falls in love with Donnie Nowitzki or with... Clyde Barrow. It's like, it's like you fall in love with the character more so than allow yourself to like, you don't feel feelings for that person. Like you don't develop. I, I've never have felt, um, you know, it's, it's never been a huge struggle for me. Also because I've been married, I think, I think if you were, if it was two single people, like it would be very easy and you, that's what you see in Hollywood. So many relationships fail because it is easy to fall for your co-star. And if you don't set up boundaries early on, in your relationship with each other or in your heart, if you know you don't want to fall for that person, then you, you don't put yourself in situations where you're going to encourage that to happen. Um, but at least in my experience, every co-star I've had has been very professional and Nate, you know, my husband, Nate makes his presence known. Like he'll come pick me up from the theater. He'll, he'll get to know my co-stars too. So that it's, you know, we're all, so that it's all kosher in that way. And I think, um, I think that's important. Um, but I also, I have a ring on my finger and I'm, I'm proud of that. I, I wear that, you know, going, I'm taken, you know, so I don't think I put out the vibes of really wanting to <laughs> develop a relationship in that way. And I have been since during Greece, I was married with, when I was 21. So my whole Broadway career, that's maintaining my marriage has been the first priority in my life. And so it takes intentionality and you know, you have to make choices along the way that prioritize that if that's something that's important to you. And for me, it was, um, my parents were divorced. My husband's parents were divorced. So when we got married, we we're like, we're not getting divorced. It's just, it's right. not an option. So we just prioritize that early, early on in our marriage and you know, no one's perfect. Anything can happen. I pray our marriage stays strong and that's my ultimate goal. But, um, you know, I'm, that's, it takes intentionality. Right. Well, what is it like uh, navigating the, in, this industry as, as a person of faith? Um, it's, well, I don't know how people do it without that, to be honest, being, being someone who I grew up in a Christian home and yes, my parents were divorced, but both were believers. And um, that was something that was just instilled in me at a young age. And my husband also shares in that faith with me. So that's, very important to find for me to find a life partner that could support me in that and be a rock and encourage me um, in that way, I think was vital. Um, but with all of the ups and downs of this business and never being really certain of anything, and especially now, <laughs> like I, I feel so grateful that I believe in something greater, that there is a foundation um, for my faith and what I believe in that I'm not defined by what I do or by how many likes I have on Instagram or how many people viewed this, you know, Zoom meeting. Um, I just think it's so important to be grounded in other things as an artist because the business is fickle and the business puts you on a podium and in a spotlight in a way that nothing else does and that can be very harmful. Um, it's a wonderful thing for a season, but same thing. You see the people in Hollywood and fame can be 
just really destructive. Um, money can be really destructive. So to be as grounded as you can um, in things outside of this business so that you can shine as bright as you can while you are in this business, uh, for me, I have found that that's really the key and the answer. And it's helped me maintain a level head through all of these years. And in times where I felt that I, you know, it's like I didn't, the same week I was in final callbacks for South Pacific after the four things, I was in callbacks for Little Mermaid to replace Sierra Bogus. Oh. And I wanted Little Mermaid. That was where my heart was. I was like, South Pacific, I, I don't know. I, I grew up with Sound of Music, but I didn't watch the South Pacific movie that much. That show didn't have a very special place in my heart. Like Ariel was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and I found out I didn't get it and I was heartbroken. Mm -hmm. And literally the next day I found out I booked South Pacific and that show is the one that changed my life, my world. <laughs> like that, like I said, legitimized me. And I just, because I trust that it's like, for me at least, it's like God's plan. He works it all for good, that there was some divine purpose that it's like when things, when things don't go your way, I just, I'm, I can stay solid in the fact that I know that something, there's a better plan that something else was supposed to come. Um, and to be honest, there are a lot of Christians in the industry for those of you that maybe, you know, have a faith and you're like, I, I am, I'm going to be forced to compromise my beliefs. And there's, they sometimes are put to the test. Um, there've been a couple roles and things that I thought I was a couple of roles I've turned down because I didn't agree with the content. And I knew that that wasn't something I wanted to put my name behind or have to do eight times a week. And then other times with Bonnie and Clyde specifically, there was one scene, Clyde was nude in the show once, and I was concerned about having to be nude. That's not something I personally feel comfortable with. Fine. If you do, I, it's not my place to judge. I just knew where my personal line was. And I think it's important to find out where you, where your line is. Um, so I had, I wrote a letter to Jeff. Here I am writing letters to all my directors, but I think it's important to do that. If you feel, if you have that on your heart, communication is just the best thing you can do. So I wrote a letter to my director and I said, just so you know, I don't feel comfortable doing this. You do not have to compromise who you are and what you believe in you guys. And there's even been, and he wrote back and was like, so kind and generous about it. He was like this. And he said, this is why I justify it for his role for Clyde. Um, but he's like, I understand that for you. And I respect that. So we will work around it. And it just, you know, it's like, if they love you and they want you, they will, they should be able to work around anything. I recently auditioned for something too, that in the script, it said, she was nude three times. And I said, before I even audition, I just want to ask if, the, is this something you're able to work around or no? And they said, yes, actually, yeah. before I even auditioned. Wow. So I think communicate, ask the questions. Don't feel like you have to compromise to fit in. And if they said no, then I think I would have to rethink about it and be like, okay, is this actually something I feel at peace about moving forward with because the role is great or the nudity is justified or whatever the line is for you, if it's a swear word or if it's a, you know, whatever it is at that where your line is of what you feel comfortable doing or not. Um, then you have to figure out if it's worth it or justified if they're not willing to, you know, adjust it. But I think learning to listen to that voice and discern is also a very important thing that I've had to do in my career. That's amazing. That's a really long-winded answer. <laughs> no, no, I love it. I think it's fantastic. It's really great. Well, I'd like to move on a little bit, if we could, and uh, to the next part of our, our interview, which is the Pivot questionnaire, which is uh, these 10 questions originally came from a French series called Bouillon de Culture, hosted by Bernard Pouvot, uh, and they're better known as the questions that James Lipton asked every guest at the end of his Inside the Actors studio television show. I'm a big fan of Jim Lipton. Lipton and uh, questions are in, in homage to Jim. So uh, here's question number one, which is, what is your favorite word? Um, I thought about this and the okay. word exquisite. Came to mind. Uh, that was the first thing. It, it was like, without question, it was like, that was the word that came to mind. I was like, all right, I guess I'll stick with it. Um, I think I like the meaning of it and it's fun to say. Uh, and it's, what's the, what's the term for a word that sounds like that is the meaning is what it sounds like uh onomatopoeic or something uh what are those words i don't know uh, anyway I, I don't it's know. Fine. but i like the word exquisite yes e e euphonious is the name e euphonious the I'll, i'm sure all you smarty pants are uh commenting yes. <laughs> like you all I got know. it right here let's see if on the if someone's chimed in <laughs> a uh, euphemism or something 
anyways. Uh, not yet. All right. So here we go. Um, what is your, then what is your least favorite word? Scab. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, both meanings of that term are, are bad, you know. Yes. As a longtime union member. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So th those of you who don't know, I, you know, a scab, of course, is what forms on your skin after you're injured, but uh, it's a derogatory term used for uh, non-union people who take union jobs during a strike. So you call them scabs. So mm. go equity, go mm. AFM. Uh, all right. So number three is what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? So what turns you on? Um, music is mm. kind of the key, I think, for me. Um, I'm very inspired by music, even when I'm having a spiritual moment, like I love to turn on music in the background. Um, and I would say for me, actually, like, a lo like alone time, I'm, I can be an introvert. I know how to turn that on and I can do that if I, if I would, I think at my core, I'm an introvert. So having like a beautiful morning with coffee and like a journal or something like that, um, really kind of. I think would get gets my juices flowing, but I um, music is kind of the key to everything. Right. So, what turns you off? Oh, um, I think it would be a collaboration where I don't feel safe, mm. um, or or a collaboration that gets like shot down. Mm. Um, yeah, I have stories, but I don't need to go into them. Okay, that's all right. Um, number five is, uh, what is your favorite curse word? <laughs> you guys, I am so Sandy Dombrowski. I don't drink <laughs> around my hair. Um, I, I do drink a little more now because of coronavirus and I'm not having to sing so much. So I'm <laughs> having a cocktail with dinner at night. But I honestly, I, I don't really swear. And when I do, it's shit. All right. <laughs> but it, maybe like I can count on one hand or maybe, maybe two. Like how many times do you do? Like once a month, I'm saying that word. <laughs> <laughs> that is very funny. Uh, so number six is what sound or noise do you love? Um, I love my dog in the morning. Mm. Um, she sleeps, I have a chihuahua mix, and she sleeps under the covers with Nate and I, like down by my feet. I don't know how she breathes. She's seven pounds. But in the morning you always feel the lump at the bottom of the bed stir and kind of come up. And then she, she like pokes her little nose out. And usually we have like a snuggle sesh for like 10 minutes every morning. She's like belly up. And there are days where she just goes, she just has this like puppy sigh of contentment that I love. Mm, I love <laughs> so consequently, what sound or noise do you hate? Um, traffic. Oh. I guess we have to become accustomed to them in New York. So I guess I don't hate them that much, but I don't know that, that maybe is the, maybe the most annoying or like an off pitch singer. <laughs> Again, we're not going to tell stories about that. No, we won't. No, we won't. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I have always wanted to, when I was little, I used to say, if I, if I, if I didn't act, I would open a dance studio and teach dance, or I would write children's books, mm. which I would still love to do. Actually. I've, I have not thought about that dream for a long time, but I've always really loved poetry and creative writing. Um, I just never wanted to pursue it because it required so much reading and writing, which was always a chore for me as a kid. So I like it as a hobby. But I don't know if as a profession, I would have been um, quite suited for it. Um, but I don't know. I think children's, that could, be, that could be really fun to do. But now it would be uh, a bakery or some like baking truck or something. I love to bake. My husband loves to cook. We have dreamed, dreamt about like getting a food truck or like opening a restaurant or starting a, a food blog or something like that or doing a web series. Um, well, so if that, only you had like a big block of time where he didn't have anything to do, you know. Right. Maybe. <laughs> if only, if only we had that. No, you guys, we've been cooking every night. Follow my husband at Nathan Johnson NY. He's posting our dinners every night. We're and we're here with two of our other friends who are also like big chefs. It's Kelly, uh, Kelly Barrett and Jared Spector, also oh, okay. Broadway alums. Um, and they also 
our total foodies. And we've been actually trying to get really creative about how to make food last and shop for all of us. We're like making whole chickens and then using the chicken to make stock and like using like ends of vegetables and stalks of things that we would have thrown away to make vegetable stock. And like, it's been really, it's been really a fun challenge in these times where like you can't go shopping for two weeks to um, right. still create kind of elaborate meals using simple ingredients. Well, as long as we're shouting out to Nate, I, I, I want to mention that he's an exceptional professional photographer. Uh, right? thanks. Yes, he is. He is quite a gift. Yes, he's great. Uh, so the, concept, uh, the, the other question to that is, what profession would you not like to do? Um, my brain goes to like running the stock exchange or something like that, where I'm like, uh, like I would have no idea what I'm doing. And I just, I'm good at math. Like I was always in advanced math, but that really doesn't have anything to do with math. But I think like being in charge of like big sums of, of money or having to be, I don't know, wrap my brain around things like analytics Mm -hmm. I'm like, I, I feel like I would be good at it if I had to be, but I hate it. So like, that's what I like, <laughs> what I want to do. <laughs> good for you. Well, that's good. I won't ask you to do that. So okay, good. Uh, the final question in the Pivot questionnaire is, uh, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Oh my gosh. Well, we already kind of talked about faith. I, sure. I think the dream would be well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm going to cry. That, I mean, that would be, that would be like, okay, I did, I fulfilled my calling. Um, and yeah, did my, did my life's purpose. Well done. I would be, I would be glad to know that God was pleased. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Uh, well, we are going to turn now to questions from our audience. And awesome. there are, there are 53 of them. We're not going to get through all of them. Onomatopoeia. <laughs> That's it. It's onomatopoeia. They all commented. Oh, good, good, good. That's onomatopoeia. exquisite. It's a word that sounds like what it is. <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that because when, uh, how Prince used to coach the, all the phantoms and he, he used to talk about how words sounded like the euphony of different sounds. Yes. Uh, like, in music of the night, you know, caress and all of these different wonderfully descriptive words in the lyrics. He made a big deal out of like, not, he used to say the intrinsic value of the words. Ah. He said, use the intrinsic value. And what he meant was like, use how the sounds of the words reinforce the meanings of words. So mm -hmm. a little shout out to uh, Mr. Howe. Absolutely. And even like their amazing lyricists, it, like with Rogers and Hammerstein, like there's so many times they use alliteration and you're like, as the artist, use that. Enunciate those C's. I'm trying to think of one off the top now. I'm being put on the spot. I'll think of one in a minute, but I don't want to waste time doing it. But it's like the, um, I looked up when you get that. I looked up when you get that. It's in Do I Love You or 10 Minutes Ago. There's a couple really, really good ones that you're just like, oh, like use these words. They are there for you to act. You know, it's so lovely. Anyway, okay, let's get some questions. Okay, uh, this one's from Adrian Williams. Uh, what tips do you have to keep up your vocal and physical health when performing eight times a week? Uh, doing this professionally requires a lifestyle and you just have to be willing to give up some of your social life to be able to do this at the professional level, at least for me. Um, it means, first of all, sleep and water. Mm. Staying hydrated and staying rested are the two most important things you can do to keep your body healthy. Um, and you also come up with tons of little tricks. Like I, there's slippery elm uh, lozenges. I, I always travel with a tin of tea bags and cough drops in my purse everywhere I go. I just always have something to suck on because if I start feeling dry, I want to make sure I have something. And then I, I will drink tea on like airplanes. I'll just ask for hot water on airplanes and just drink tea on planes. Um, now, especially, um, so always just having those things at your disposal. There's a great uh, throat spray I love called Singer's Saving Grace. You can get it online, I think, or I, the corner store, like literally around the corner for me on 68th Street, the little bodega has it, but you can also get it like Whole Foods. Um, and uh, let's see, what else? More, just warm water with honey is a great thing. Honey is a fantastic lubricant um, for your throat and your cords. Um, but I think again, it all stems back to, and not talking at loud restaurants. I don't, I don't drink that much. It's just, it's a lifestyle of just knowing that your voice is 
my voice is my livelihood. And right. so I have to treat it with care and respect and, you know, not blowing my voice out on Tuesday, knowing I have to, an eight show week ahead. It's learning to also just, um, this building stamina, first of all, but pacing yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of times we come back on Tuesday and I'm like, Whoa, I had a day off. I, usually Tuesdays are like the best shows, at least vocally, because I'm like, I'm so rested and it's only been a day, but it's been a day. And sure. then, um, you know, kind of as the week goes on, you get more tired, but also more adrenaline because those weekend crowds are, they yeah. get you through. <laughs> Do you have a, like a physical and mental work? Uh, like, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Prep, That's, prep work. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm not religious about uh, like a, a mental or physical or even vocal warm up. I tend to be like, where am I at today? I often will hum. I have to warm up a little, but mm. I'm one that my warm up is all in my like head voice and mix. And mm -hmm. I save the belting for when I get on the stage and let the show warm me up and the adrenaline and the heat of my body and everything get me to the place where I'm ready to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I know other, I've worked with other co-stars and artists who like, I have to hit the note in my dressing room before I go out there to make sure I have it. Mm -hmm. And I'll hear them belting in their room before they go on. And I think right. you, then you have to figure out what works for you and what you feel most comfortable. There is no like, you must do this, this, this. Sure. Um, you have to figure out your own instrument and, and you know, what you need. Um, but I do like to stretch a little bit. I think physical, I did a little yoga this morning. I've been waking up every morning and I'm like, I literally am like a 10 minute, you know, just some flow, some breathing, um, stretching, trying to keep my body limber, maybe a few like sit-ups and I plank during shows. So usually in every Broadway show I've done, I found 60 seconds in my routine of the show to plank when I'm off stage. Um, so it's built into my routine. I get in really good shape when I'm in a show because I, I just build that in. Um, and so, you know, finding little things you can do um, just to, to maintain that. I walk around in New York. I live in a five-story walk-up. So, you know, I'm able to get exercise that way. But I personally have, I don't have a gym membership. I've never had a gym membership. Um, and then I think you also have to figure out what you can eat. You know, I, I like to, I don't like to feel full doing a show. So I usually... I'll have a salad or sushi is often a, a go-to thing, but you have to be careful that it's good sushi. You can't have bad sushi before your show. No. So learning, learning kind of what your body needs to fuel yourself to get through a lot of like all the guys go to the gym between shows and have like a Chipotle burrito. And I'm like, I don't know how you do that. Like I need to kind of lay low between shows, no. um, not talk very much. I will maybe have one friend to my dressing room if I'm like, you know, or we'll watch a movie. But I've also found that I can't fall asleep. A lot of people nap between shows. I can't fall asleep because mm. it makes my voice go back to sleep and I have to like re-wake up my voice. Um, so I've found for me that I need to rest it, but not let it like, not let my body totally fall asleep between shows. That's great. So, yeah, you gotta figure out what works for you. All right, so this question is from uh, Levon Mathis. Uh, for people looking to get into the business, how can we find longevity to be able to do what we love as a lifelong career? I think it's a great forward looking question, right? It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's how do you not become a, a one show wonder? And um, I mean, I feel like I'm trying to figure that out right now because now I'm in that phase of life where I'm no longer, hopefully, I hopefully can still be an ingenue a little longer, but I'm no longer like the high school young girl and I'm not quite the mom. I mean, I'm going in for some mom stuff, but like, I feel like I'm in this kind of in-between phase that I'm not like the hot new thing anymore. So I, it's tricky. I think being a, I mean, having the talent that can sustain you for more than one specific role is important. Also having a work ethic and being someone that people want to work with becomes important because yes, it is about talent, but if it, everybody's talented, if it's between two people who are talented, but one is a diva and one is, has a good reputation, hopefully they go with the someone who has a good reputation. So I remember during Greece, which was my first thing. I worked very hard. That was something that was important to me. I worked hard to establish a good reputation. I never missed a show due to sickness. So I already took probably over care of myself. I was like, I can't go out. I can't drink. I can't do this. I was like kind of a, a nun about it. Um, <laughs> but I, it paid off because I, I feel like I established that work ethic. I, I had to take a week vacation, but those are the only eight performances I missed in the year. Um, and so 
that I think helped me. It looked good to Kathleen Marshall. It made her want to call me back in for Anything Goes. And then off of one audition, I was able to book that role because I didn't have to prove anything anymore. I already proved myself. So at the beginning, work hard to establish who you want people to see you as. <laughs> Um, and if that requires some work, work at it because it's hard to go backwards once you've, uh, once you become known as something else, I guess. Yeah. Um, not to say that doesn't prevent people from some divas work all the time and it's great and nobody's perfect and we all have things. I'm, I'm, I know I've had diva moments, you know what I mean? So it's not that it's not striving for perfection, but just being someone people want to work with. Um, and then taking care of yourself. And we're lucky that we work in a field where there are roles for a wide variety of age ranges. We're not dancers solely. Maybe some of you are, but you know, their career is over at 26 and they have to find something else to do. And so, you know, there are mothers and fathers and grandparents and children in what we do. So hopefully it is something that can sustain you forever. And I also think you do not have to work on Broadway to be successful. <laughs> you, if you love what you do, we can do it our whole life. I, I could be, I could not be, maybe I'll have a dry spell on Broadway for the next 10 years. And then I'll be like, Hey, I'm sick of trying to work here. Maybe I'll go back to Minneapolis where I'm from. And I feel like I could be a big fish in a small pond there and, and have a really find, you know, a really, really great community working back in Minnesota where I, where I started. So I think there are, there are a lot of options or when you're not doing a show, start a concert series. Like I did start doing right. concerts or put yourself online. Like there are so many different ways to be creative and use your gifts. Um, whether it's playing the lead in a Broadway show or not, you know? Right. Well, this it leads very well to my next question here. This is from uh, Rachel Faria. Uh, and she asks, uh, what are your views on type? Uh, being, uh, being a student, I hear both sides from even within my school staff, quote, figure out your type and stick to it, that will get you jobs, end quote, as well as, quote, type isn't real, don't let people put you into a box. So is, right. is following your type still the way to find success in the professional field? Or is it something that's being pushed to the sidelines? This is so good. This is yeah. a really, really great subject. And again, I am just one voice to add to this. I don't know the right or wrong. And that's why theater and, and art in general is so subjective. That's why I go to see a show that I didn't understand at all. And yet it, get a, it gets a rave review in the New York Times the next day. Like there is no like five step plan to follow. There's no perfect cookie cutout um, answer to any of these questions, which is why it's exciting and stimulating to talk about it. For me personally, this is what I say to that question. I know, uh, I know the essence that I give off and I know what my voice sounds like. <laughs> and that type of, those types of qualities automatically cater to a specific type of roles. And I know that I'm good at those things. And I know that that's where I shine because I'm able to bring the best of who I am to those types of roles. Might I get cast doing something else? Potentially, hopefully, because that'd be a fun challenge, right? However, I, I know that I'm not going to get cast as the angsty rock and roll chick in Jagged Little Pill. That's just not who I am. I'm not the best person for that role. If I, if I was forced to do it, I would come up with a way to make it believable and I would go there and I would be like, okay, cool. But when the industry is so competitive, I know someone else is gonna walk in the room that embodies that essence and that has that voice. So me trying to do that is just gonna be a little ungenuine or fake. So uh, what I tend to say is embrace your giftings, embrace the gifts you have and go toward roles where those can shine. Mm -hmm. um, but with something like Bonnie, which is, you know, she's a murderer and I'm like, oh, I don't, you know, I've never had experience doing that. She was the bad girl. And for the first time I got to be, I wasn't just the ingenue, like princess type of thing. So that role excited me, but on the other hand, I found things in Bonnie that I, Laura, could relate to. Mm -hmm. I read lots of, I did a lot of history uh, and research about her because she was a, a real person that existed. And it was, I was fun for me to find out that she loved poetry 
And that was a big part of our show, actually. And like I said earlier, I said, I've always loved creative writing and poetry. And so I latched onto that side of Bonnie. And she also dreamed of being on Broadway as a little girl. I always said in interviews during that show that I was like, Bonnie would flip if she was a Broadway musical about her. You know? <laughs> um, that would be her so that was me too. Like I was the little girl dreaming of being on Broadway and like liking, you know, getting in front of people or being, you know, having that, knowing how to turn on that showmanship. Um, so yes, I, at the end of the day, even with characters who are different from you, I feel like I, you're still bringing pieces of yourself to them. And I know that for me, if I was to audition for a role that completely broke my type, I'm established enough in my career now that people think of me a certain way. And I, I don't want to be balled, ball and chained to that. You know, I don't want to be chained to only being the princess. In fact, that's why I thought Bandstand was really exciting for me because I was like, oh, wow, this is going to be really great. I mean, it's a, a war. I'm playing a war widow. It's really complex. She's lost her husband. There's a lot of rich acting and cool, different. I'm the jazz singer in this jazz band. Like that could be a really cool thing for me it didn't end, that show didn't end up having the amount of success that we all thought, but I thought that was going to be a big turning point for me in my career. And it was lovely. Don't get me wrong. Like it was a great thing, but I didn't get a Tony nomination. I didn't, you know, it was ended up being kind of a disappointing experience in that regard. And yet one of the most fulfilling things I've ever done in my life was getting to play Julia Trojan and develop that role. So I, I would say Audition for everything. If you have the passion in your spirit and there's something in you that's like, I would be, I could be good at that. I could bring something different to that. But at the end of the day, there are certain roles I know I'm just not, I'm going to be third best at. Mm -hmm. There's going to be someone else walking in the room who embodies that. And I have to try to be that. And so um, I know my type, I know my strengths and I'm, and I go towards things where those can shine. I'm sense. glad you brought up Bandstand. Uh, I, I want to do a little plug here because it's it's being broadcast on on Playbill, right? You, you know about this, right? Yes. Yeah. So Absolutely. Fr- we're releasing it on Friday. Yeah. Uh, Playbill, um, and you can purchase it for six dollars and ninety nine cents, yes. and you can watch it however many times you want for the week. So it's this coming Friday to the following Friday, um, and you can stream it on Playbill and watch it over and over. That's true. And side note, small world. Uh, I went to college with Richard Oberecker. No way. <laughs> and Andy, didn't Andy Blankenbuehler go to that college? They met in college, I thought. They, they, no, uh, they met in Cincinnati when they were both in college. Uh, yes. Andy went to Xavier. Yes. So, um, actually, no. no, I think Andy did go to CCM. He just wasn't there when I was there. Got it. He might All be right. Happy. So here I'm going to, we're going to wrap up uh, with our final question from the, 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 uh, the Q and a board here. And uh, actually more than one person has asked the same question. So that's why I thought it'd be a good one. So Great. what, what advice would you give to your younger self in regards to theater or, or anything really? Yeah. Um, the three things I always say, and we've touched on these things already especially for, this is kind of more specific for like theater and for auditions. Life is a whole nother, a whole nother thing, but we talked a little bit about that too, but be, so be yourself owning the gift that you have and, and, um, being proud of who you are and the type and the type that you are, the voice that you have, not being ashamed of that and owning it every time you walk into the audition room and, uh, that it just, it will bring a sense of, just real realism, people want, and genuineness. People want to work with people who are genuine and who aren't putting something on. So own who you are and, and be confident in those gifts. Um, secondly, be patient. There are plenty of things I did not get um, that did not go my way. Greece at community theater. And then I, I did not book Greece. And then a couple years later, booked it at the dinner theater. And then a couple years after that, won a national competition to play Sandy and Greece on Broadway. So like, just relax, just your time will come. Keep working hard, putting yourself out there, learn that lesson of humility um, and let every experience make you into the artist that you will someday be. Um, And then also, as we've said, know that there's no five-step plan to follow. It's not, if I do this and this and this, I will be successful. I will be on Broadway. Um, I know people who, graduated from Juilliard and can't find a job. I know people who started when they were five years old and have been doing 
this forever or people who discovered it in, in high school that they were like, oh, I have a good voice and I want to pursue this. Cool. I know people who booked a Broadway show, went to college for like a conservatory training, booked one Broadway show, realized they hated it and then left and went back to school for something else. Like there is no, like there's no rhyme or reason. So learning to to plow your own path and listen to your heart also sounds so cliche, but we talked about that earlier, just kind of discerning. I had a very unconventional path. I ended up leaving school. I did post-secondary as a high schooler, I ended up leaving college, and then I won a TV reality show that made my dream come true on Broadway. Like, people are like, what's your advice? I'm like, win a reality show? I don't know. Like, that won't happen to me. But good thing I was in tune enough with where with with what my heart got excited about and the opportunities that came my way of trying to seize the, the moments when they happened because they won't always be there and they a lot of times will pass you by or sometimes you'll have two things you have to choose from and that's a champagne problem I mean may we all maybe all be so lucky but even in those cases in my life where it's like where where do you get most excited about where do you feel the peace so learning to plow your own path at the end of the day because everyone else has an idea of of how to best train you or prepare you or equip you. And, um, you only, you know, what you, what you really want and what's going to be right for you because everybody's story is vastly different. So plow your, make your own story. Make your own story. I love it. Well, I can't thank you enough, Laura. I super duper appreciate you being here. Uh, and I'm sure let's give props to Laura Osnes. Yay. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. I hope this was entertaining. It feels so weird just to talk for like two hours, but yeah. um, talk about my life. But it's, as you said, I'm sure I'm so glad you had Tara Rubin. I mean, everybody's perspective is so valuable and I'm thrilled to be able to just hopefully share some experiences that either inspired or educated or encouraged you guys, all of you in your journey. You bet. So the SDSU Studio Series returns on Friday, April 8th at 4 p.m. Eastern with Broadway music director Mary Mitchell Campbell. And next week's guests will be Richard Maltby Jr., Jeffrey Saver, and Georgia Stitt. The series continues on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at the same time until May 6th. See our website for details sdsustudioseries.wordpress.com. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Bye.